All right, welcome to the first half of lecture 3-3. This is where we start to get into the intracranial anatomy and we'll go from outside to in. So first we have to learn about the connective tissue and the, um, uh, the different types of uh, sinuses and folds in the brain as well as the ventricular system before we move in deeper and look at the arteries and veins and the actual uh, gyri and sulci that make up the brain and their functional elements. So moving right in, first of course we have to define the different regions of the brain. There is an anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa, and that's defined by the lesser wing of the sphenoid as well as the petrous ridge. Uh, so um, those two boundaries make up the middle cranial fossa and then the anterior is in front of that, posterior is behind it. So moving on, let's talk about there are three different types of connective tissue that surround the brain. The first of these is a really thick, really tough, uh, leathery layer uh, called the dura mater. Uh, the dura mater anchors the brain in a lot of ways and uh, protects the brain. It also forms sinuses through which venous blood can drain out of the cranium. So these are very important structures. Just below the uh, dura mater, we have the arachnoid membrane, so named because it has little fibery uh, extensions that look like a spider's web. And this below the, uh, the subarachnoid space, the, the space below the arachnoid membrane, is the space where the cerebrospinal fluid flows. So this is also an important structure. Um, <clears throat> next, we have the pia mater. The pia mater is so named because it's very thin and very delicate and it's adherent to the surface of the parenchyma of the brain or the functional elements of the brain. So we'll move through these next few slides and see these highlighted in different ways. So here we see that the dura mater can divide into two different layers of connective tissue. There is a periosteal dura, which periosteal means across the surface of the bone. Then we have the meningeal dura, meningeal meaning closer to the brain. Where these two layers separate, we have what's known as a dural sinus. And again, venous blood flows through the dural sinus between the periosteal and meningeal layers. Where the meningeal layer folds over onto itself, we have what's known as a dural fold. And so uh, there you can see labeled the dural sinus. Uh, now in yellow. Next with the arachnoid membrane, uh, the main components of that is this sheet-like uh, structure and hanging down off of it into the subarachnoid space are the, uh, the spider-like uh, portions of this connective tissue. Between the uh, subarachnoid space and the dural sinuses, we have an opening, and those openings are called the arachnoid granulations. So these will be visible within a dural sinus, and we'll see better examples of that in this lecture. But they allow for the CSF to flow out of the subarachnoid space into the venous system so that that CSF can return to the venous system and be metabolized and uh, whatnot. Now the pia mater is the highly vascularized portion of the connective tissue. So this is where we'll find all of the arteries as they dive down toward the brain itself to supply and branch out into the capillaries. Uh, and the pia mater is uh, very heavily associated with, uh, invested into the parenchyma of the brain. So this pia mater, as the arteries dive down into it, uh, will follow those arteries and invest down into the structure of the brain. So you can't really peel away the pia mater too easily in a lot of places. Now, in situ, this is what the dura mater uh, and the arachnoid membrane will look like on the surface of the brain. So first here we have removed the calvarium, which is the top of the skull, and we have now cut away an opening in the dura mater and folded up the dura mater so you can see the arachnoid membrane on the surface of the brain within the cranium. Now we've taken the calvarium completely off. We've re uh, retained the dura mater here. So this is the um, this is the dura mater. You can see the dural fold or the dural sinus coming down where the uh, dura mater folds inward. So here we have the 
dural sinus with arachnoid granulations associated with that so that that CSF can flow out. Uh, now on this side we have removed the uh, meningeal dura mater and we can see the, sub, the arachnoid membrane and here we've removed the arachnoid membrane and we can see the vasculature associated with the pia mater. Next we have to talk about uh, some other ways uh, in which the uh, calvarium is drained. So the calvarium is the bone cap on top of the cranium itself and so that is drained by uh, different structures. There are diploic veins and emissary veins. Diploic veins are so named because they reside within the calvarium itself, just like a diplomat resides within a country. And emissary veins travel out from the dural sinuses to the, uh, the uh, superficial, to uh, the cutaneous uh, venous drainage system, just like an emissary travels through a country. Uh, so here these emissary veins are something to pay attention to because uh, they can uh, flow either direction. They can backflow because there's a lack of, uh, of uh, valves within the veins of the cranium. <clears throat> so uh, we mentioned the dural folds and the dural sinuses before, uh, but these structures uh, are, are, they have specific names that we need to understand because they form important structures associated with the brain. So here we can see the different dural folds within the cranium and the openings that uh, exist within the dural folds. So here on this side in this drawing, we can see the names of these different structures. The Falx cerebri is the dural fold that is between the two hemispheres of the uh, cerebrum, uh, so uh, so named, uh, fairly easy to see. Tentorium cerebelli is the tent that resides on top of the cerebellum, the little brain, in the uh, coming off the back of the brain stem of the pons. So the tentorium cerebelli, the tent over the cerebellum. We also have a Falx cerebelli that's splitting the two hemispheres of the cerebellum uh, so that also makes sense we have a, a, a fun little um, connective tissue layer around the um, the pituitary gland uh, and that is called the diaphragm cellae and so the diaphragm cellae uh, sits over and around the pituitary uh, forming a diaphragm on top of it so that uh, it can't move or get out or, or uh, any issues like that. Uh, so now let's talk about these different sinuses that are formed that are within the different folds we just talked about. So within the false cerebri, on the superior portion of it, we have the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, it is the most superior sinus and it is uh, on the sagittal midline, so it is the superior sagittal sinus. The inferior sagittal sinus here in blue is in the inferior portion of the Falx cerebri. Following that, we connect those two via a sinus here, the straight sinus. The straight sinus connects the, uh, the inferior sagittal sinus to the superior sagittal sinus, which drain into the confluence of the sinus. So the confluence of the sinus is in the occipital midline in the posterior portion of the brain. Uh, <clears throat> now, draining away from the confluence of the sinus down either side, we have what are called transverse sinuses, one to either side of the brain. They communicate with the sigmoid sinuses, sigmoid because they are S-shaped around the back of the skull. Uh, so they will curve around uh, in the occipital bone. Finally, uh, we have some sinuses we haven't talked about yet around the cella turcica, named the cavernous sinus. Uh, we've talked, we actually have mentioned that before in terms of the danger zone of the face and the drainage from the superficial cutaneous face through the orbit into the cavernous sinus. So now we're learning about that in more depth here. So the sigmoid sinuses will drain into the internal jugular veins uh, to go to the, uh, the uh, subclavian veins, the uh, brachiocephalic vein, to return to the heart. Uh, 
Now, the cavernous sinus, we have to kind of clarify its location. It is around the cella tercica in which the uh, pituitary gland sits. Cella tercica means Turkish saddle. It looks like that, uh, you know, well-scooped Turkish saddle structure. So the cavernous sinus drains to the, uh, the sigmoid sinus and the transverse sinus via two different uh, small connecting sinuses. So uh, heading inferiorly to the sigmoid sinus, we have the inferior petrosal sinus. Uh, heading along the petrous ridge, we have the seri uh, superior petrosal sinus going to the transverse sinus. So that's how we get drainage from the cavernous sinus. So the cavernous sinus has some important associated structures with it. In fact, numerous cranial nerves travel through the cavernous sinus. This includes 3, 4, V1, V2, and 6. V3 does not because V3 travels inferiorly through foramen ovale, so it avoids the cavernous sinus completely. But the rest of them, 3 through 6, except for V3, travel through the cavernous sinus. We'll see, we can see here that the pituitary gland sits within the cavernous sinus, and the pituitary stalk travels through the optic chiasm. So those are some landmarks you'll see when looking at the, uh, the, uh, the ventral side, the ventral view of the brain itself. Uh, so now let's talk about the internal carotid artery. So it travels into the brain, to, into the cranium to supply the brain, <clears throat> but in so doing it travels through the cavernous sinus. We can see here that the internal carotid artery has a number of different portions to it. Here's the internal uh, uh, carotid artery as it enters the, uh, the uh, carotid canal, that portion within the uh, petrous portion of the temporal bone is called the petrous part. Next we have the cavernous part because this portion uh, travels through the cavernous sinus before entering into the intracranial space, the cerebral part. The cavernous part, you can see it's very circuitous, curving follows with the cavernous sinus. It's thought that the, uh, the, the carotid artery travels through the cavernous sinus as a way to help regulate the temperature of blood as it enters the brain so that the temperature of the blood as it's traveling through the neck doesn't shock the, uh, the brain structures in, in one way or another. So by um, uh, you know, regulating its temperature by traveling through this kind of venous radiator, it's uh, regulating, it's, it's uh, adjusting its temperature to that spent venous blood as it's exiting. So um, that's thought to be one of the benefits of this arrangement. Um, so, <clears throat> of course, if an infection travels from the face through the ophthalmic veins into the cavernous sinus, it can become associated with these cranial nerves. It can become associated with the carotid artery and cause problems with these structures. So, uh, these facial uh, uh, infections, if they travel deep, uh, they'll begin to manifest initially as cranial nerve problems with these cranial nerves. And then it can travel very quickly into the uh, systemic circulation and cause uh, encephalitis and systemic shock, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so that's what these next few slides are reminding you of, that venous drainage into the cavernous sinus associated with that danger zone we've already talked about and looking at those structures in more detail. The, uh, uh, the, the ophthalmic, superior ophthalmic, uh, heading into the uh, cavernous sinus here. So next thing we need to talk about before we get into the arteries and veins is the ventricular system. There are four uh, ventricles within the brain. There are two lateral ventricles, then there's a third and a fourth ventricle. So the uh, the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, is produced within these ventricles, primarily within the lateral ventricles, uh, by specialized ependymal cells, which are kind of like a, a, an endothelial cell uh, designed to secrete uh, this specialized CSF fluid to help clean and flush the brain and remove toxins from 
the brain parenchyma. Actually, when you sleep, one of the reg regenerative uh, processes of sleep is that the neurons and glia within your brain actually shrink slightly in size to allow for more extracellular space through which CSF flows and removes the toxins that the neurons and glia have uh, released from their uh, somas. Uh, so that's one of the important functions of CSF. It also circulates uh, some of these nourishing components uh, for the glia and the neurons. So here we can see here the flow of CSF from the lateral ventricles. Uh, so uh, let's see, yes, so lateral ventricles in red. And so these lateral ventricles are a C shape on either side of your uh, either hemisphere and they're uh, embedded deep below the corpus callosum, below the cerebrum. And so they form the C shape uh, within your cranium, within your brain parenchyma. And they communicate with the third ventricle uh, by first emptying into the interventricular uh, foramen here uh, to travel to the third ventricle. So those ependymal cells are closely associated with what's called the choroid plexus within the ventricles. And so this choroid plexus is a bunch of um, kind of loose capillaries uh, covered in these ependymal cells that, that uh, so the, the choroid plexus gets the water and fluid and plasma components from the blood and mixes those with the, um, the nurturing proteins, enzymes made by the ependymal cells and releases that into the CSF, which is traveling through these ventricles. So now we're into the third ventricle. We've traveled through the interventricular frame to the third ventricle. Third ventricle drains uh, through the cerebral aqueduct, which connects to the fourth ventricle. So this is the superior view, as if you were looking down on the top of the head. This is the lateral view, as if you're looking at the side. And uh, here's the lateral view drawn uh, of just isolated ventricles. Uh, so now we're in the fourth ventricle here in green. <clears throat> the fourth ventricle has two different openings within it. Uh, it has a median and a lateral aperture within the fourth ventricle. Uh, the fourth ventricle is actually continuous down the uh, spinal cord, continues as the uh, central canal of the spinal cord, uh, but the uh, CSF flows out of these median apertures into the subarachnoid space to coat the outside of the brain. So these apertures is how CSF gets from the ventricles to the subarachnoid space. <clears throat> now the uh, CSF now in the subarachnoid space, once it's spent or you know has, has flown throughout the subarachnoid space, will exit the ventricle, the subarachnoid space, via the uh, arachnoid granulations. Uh, also known as arachnoid villi. And so this shows the complete diagram of that CSF flow, beginning in the choroid plexus, traveling to the third ventricle, down to the fourth, flowing out through the median and lateral apertures to the subarachnoid space, from the subarachnoid space through the arachnoid villi, or arachnoid granulations, into the dural sinuses, which is now the venous blood flow. And that venous blood flow filled with, uh, including this CSF, will flow through the sinuses into the uh, internal jugular vein to go back to the heart. <clears throat> so that's the end for this lecture. We'll talk about the uh, vasculature and venous drainage uh, in more detail in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.